I have placed, if you go to the class webpage, I've got a link to a sample design document uh, that Joseph assured me was a good one, uh, or at least it had been graded well for, from a prior class. Uh, feel free to, to shamelessly steal it. I mean, the design itself won't do any good, but you know. Gain inspiration for that. Speaking of which, let me back up a minute. Uh, Jerry Weinberg, one of, one of the great and seminal figures in software engineering, uh, from a very young age, wrote the Psychology of Computer Programming, which I, I strongly would urge all of you at some point after this class to buy and read. For one thing, it, you, you'll, you'll, you'll marvel, because it's written in 1971, so all the technology he talks about is very old technology. But Jerry touched, even the head of Fred Brooks, touched on almost every key issue involved in software engineering. Uh, he even came up with the, you know, trying to make a baby in one month with nine women analogy before Fred Brooks used it in the mythical man month. Uh, but I, I <coughs> Jerry Weinberg has a, a well, he's, he's probably got 30 or 40 great books. I have a lot of them. He's got one call on becoming a technical consultant and, or technical leader. Uh, and in it, what he talks about, uh, in his usual somewhat tongue-in-cheek fashion, he says, the three great sources of ideas, of creative ideas, are mistakes as trying to do something and suddenly discovering, oh wait, you know, that's not working, but I now have an idea. Theft, borrowing the idea from some other source, I'm going to take this and I'm going to improve, improve upon it. Uh, I've already quoted Steve Jobs, you know, good artists copy, great artists steal. And as Jerry puts it, copulation, it says taking two different ideas and bringing them together. It says the problem is from our childhood we're taught not to steal, uh, not, to, not to make mistakes, and not to copulate outside of marriage. And he says, so we're all conditioned against devising ideas. Uh, you will find in software engineering one of your most valuable sources of information are what other people have done. This is why you read, there are few things, and, and I, I, I suspect all of you already know this, there are few things more, pri more priceless to a programmer, particularly if you're using a new technology, than snippets of working code. I can't tell you how many different languages and environments and libraries I've had to use over the years. And one of the first things I go is, you know, how do I do X? You know, I'm working under an X step. How do I open up a window with a title bar on it, this and this and this? And what I want is the working code that will make it work, because then I can take that working snippet and I can start modifying and say, well, what happens if I do this? Okay, I have to do this, and I look at the API documentation and so on. <clears throat> Don't feel that you have to invent things from scratch. Indeed, the, the road to success is to buy, borrow, reuse anything that is essential <coughs> to your project and then use your creative energy on that which distinguishes your project from everything else. This is the buy versus build dilemma that you have, in, uh, uh, particularly in corporate things. You buy the software. Just go find some vendor and buy, license, whatever, the software that's necessary to operate. You don't want to write your own accounting packages. Corporations used to do that 30, 40 years ago. Now you go out and go, we're going to get Oracle Financials or you know, SAP or whatever. And where you want to put your creative efforts is where you're going to get your competitive edge. Which was a very long lead in to say, you know, I've got a design document out there. Feel free, I literally feel free to, to file off the serial numbers and just fill it in. Now, the approach they have may not work for your particular project. Uh, and you may want to do something else. And we will talk, when we go over the design documents next week, we'll talk more about design and architecture. But all that said, 
What is software architecture? What is software design? Uh, the first, first item here, prioritization or selection of guiding principles and concepts. This is so important. The idea is what, you know, I've quoted almost every week, you know, in, in architecting a new system, all the important mistakes are made in the first day. Spin Red, 1998. Uh, that's one of my mantras. The question is, what is it you're really trying to do? Uh, and what is it that you aren't going to do as a result? The, uh, so you want your guiding principles, you know, what's important is that this run on iOS. What is important is that this run cross-platform. What is important is that this have a very fast response time. Uh, in doing a word processor at Pages, we became obsessively focused on the delay between when someone presses a key and a letter shows up on the screen. People will not use a word processor where that delay is beyond a certain fraction of a second. And we put a lot of effort and creative work in making that interval as brief as possible. And again, we're talking 25 years ago, so it's not like, you know, we're running on like <coughs> 16 or 25 megahertz, 32-bit uh, systems. <laughs> these aren't blindingly fast. I mean, they, 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 these are very slow primitive systems compared to what you've got today. Uh, the fundamental structure and environment of the solution. Uh, and again, a lot of you have already been addressing this. You know, what, what's our target environment or environments? Uh, you know, what's going to be the programming language and why? What is going to be our fundamental approach? Uh, a lot of you have been using Model View Controller, one of the classic, it's actually a classic design pattern, but uh, can, can be considered an architectural decision. What are the resulting constraints and opportunities due to the choices you've made? And then, does, does everyone have buy-in? Years ago, I was attending a developer's conference for Intelligent, which was a joint effort by IBM, HP, and Apple to try and come up with a with the equivalent of next step, an object-oriented operating system. The problem is they use C++ instead of Objective-C. There was no root object class, and it failed miserably. But that, oops, but that said, Tom Affinito was one of the instructors there, and he and I were talking about architecture, and he made a comment which I've remembered and quoted many times since, which is that architecture is a political act. Uh, Brooks talks about conceptual unity in architecture, but it can't be handed down from Mount Sinai. You have to get people to buy into your architecture. You have to be able to explain it. If I can find them in my stacks and stacks of boxes and bins uh, in uh, my basement, I still have the three large graph paper diagrams that I created with multiple, multiple revisions of each that were the fundamental architecture for pages. One was a class, or class hierarchy. One was showed the structure of a document. And one showed the fundamental components of the software and how they interact with each other. Did these with colored pens on a very large graph paper pad. Like I said, I, I produced multiple versions of each, and when I came with the final versions of each, with each new engineer I'd hire, I'd go down to Kinko's and get color copies of all three sheets and hand them to her or him. And say, this is what we're building. Uh, and that actually turned out to be very effective uh, as some guidelines. Now, I'm not asking for architecture documents, but architecture is stuff you guys are doing anyway. This is from Software Engineering Institute at Carnegie Mellon. This is their definition of the architectural process. Establish requirements by analyzing the business driver, system context, and factors that system, stake ugh, system stakeholders deem critical success. You have to make sure you're actually solving the problem that wants to be solved. There is, there is a lure in saying, oh, this is so cool, I'm going to build something that does X. And if it doesn't solve the problem of the person who's either going to buy it or is paying for it or both, it's not going to work. 
coming up with the architectural structures, and boy, they're, they're, I've got half a dozen books on software architecture, so this is not a class in software architecture, but coming up with the design, evaluating it, and then documenting it. Now, what we're going to have here is we're going to have you do design, which are your specific solutions to implementing the architecture. All of you in your requirements document have in fact laid out much of what would be considered architecture. Building an application that does this, this is the response time, this is where it's going to operate in. Here's what's important, this is what we want. Uh, your design requirements can be, man can be mandated design things. You, you know, we will do this or we will not do this. Sometimes it's very important to describe what you're not going to do uh, to keep over enthusiastic developers from sort of going off into the weeds. You want the goal of ensuring conceptual unity. So the design, the elements of the design have to work together. As I mentioned before, when I got brought into Air Inc. as a chief architect consultant, <clears throat> I asked to see the architecture document. All they had were four design drawings for four different subsystems. And I tried to, you know, and they all showed internal structure for each of the subsystems and then some external interfaces. And guess what? The external interfaces didn't, didn't fit. They had no architecture. I had to design an architecture and then redesign the four subsystems to all fit within that architecture. You don't want to do that. You want to start off with a consistent architecture and go from there. Your design can cover a wide variety of areas. A lot of you have already touched on some of this in your requirements. UX, UI, database design, or data structure design. Uh, patterns and module interfaces. Here's something which you guys have probably already learned to some extent in your programming. There are two types of interfaces to any kind of library or environment. One is sort of the literal, I want to look up, you know, what the open, you know, create window uh, call is to, to bring up a window on the screen. And then there's the deep interface, which is the information of, I have to make this call and this call and then this call to the operating system in order to successfully get all of this done. In other words, there is often an interface that involves correct combinations, or avoiding incorrect combinations, of calls to modules, subsystems, APIs, so on and so forth. <clears throat> so you want to, and particularly if you've got work divided up, you want to make sure that team members working on one point not only know what the actual calls are they can make to the subsystem being worked on by the team members, but the correct way of making those calls. How they have to make them, when they should make them, what they should or shouldn't do. Coding standards and guidelines are a correct aspect or essential aspect of design. Uh, I've written coding documents. More and more you can usually find sort of suggested coded coding standards and guidelines, but I've, again, in Herring, everyone was, they were all C programmers, they were new to C++. One of the things I had to do is write a C++ coding standards and guidelines document for them, saying, this is how you name variables, this is how you will structure your function calls, this is what you will do, this is what you won't do. Your design may also define use of specific tools, solutions, libraries, and languages. A lot of that is in architecture, but some of it comes down to design. The actual deliverables will often depend upon the methodology being used. Uh, <clears throat> again, I've got the sample design document on there. It's got, the, the one that's out there has got, and there's, I've got multiple links now. It's, it's uh, in the, what's the front page? CS4, so you go to CS428 class. There we go. Here's an example of well done design document. It's big, it's like a megabyte, so it'll take a while long. It's a PDF. But you can look at it. So they've got, you know, purpose of document, purpose of the product. They've got a discussion of the front end design with some details, screenshots.
class hierarchy. Just want to make sure that's what it was. Got their back end design and some details. So that's their that's their design document. Uh, again, I urge you to identify the hard problems up front, prioritize them because if you wait till the end, it will cause you to blow your schedule. Uh, so your assignment is to create and upload your initial design document. This is the usual one week time, should be up there by Saturday. We'll do presentations and we'll have you talk about what you did and why. And with that, let's take a 10 minute break. When we come back, we will do the readings review. Uh, and then after that, we will turn the time over for team meeting.